on the Zeus Radio Network for Hear Women Talk. Welcome back, everybody, to Time's Up, where Delilah from ImaginePublicity.com and also the creator of the Time's Up blog for crime survivors join you each week, bringing you cases, bringing you authors, bringing you people that are really needing a voice in, in, in silence as far as justice goes across the country. Let's pull it up. Battered spouse syndrome. Now, this goes to our next case. Um, because this is, in my opinion, a victim of intimate partner homicide. And it was a case in, it's actually, we're coming up on the three-year anniversary of a young man, father of two, who uh, was ending a relationship, told the person that he was with it was over with, and things got turned around, and he wound up losing his life, in my opinion. His name is Daniel Underwood, 33 years old, Sulphur Springs, Texas. Um... And joining us today is his mom, Donna, Donna Underwood, and also Maria Harvick. Donna is, is his mom. And we first had and featured this case on CrimeWire about a year ago. And since that time, or since the, the date of Daniel's death, the mother has been relentless in pursuing justice. The death certificate, as we've seen in a lot of these cases, was stamped suicide. Um, for a lot of reasons. A lot of it has to do with witnesses, information. It has to do with ballistics or the lack thereof. It has to do with the lack of a police investigation. Nobody's really at fault here except for the truth isn't coming out. So Donna and Maria, both of you, thank you so much for being here on the show. Thank you. Thank you. And, and Donna, um, you have two grandbabies that are, are Daniels, don't you? Yes. How old are they now? Um the oldest one is nine, and he also had uh, one that's 13 that he raised since he was a year old. So was he raising these children, or were they with their mom when he died? No, they were they were with their mom. We, that he had them every other weekend. He had them every other weekend. He was a very loving dad, wasn't he? Yes, he was. And, you know, when's the last time you spoke to him prior to September 4th, 2008? Uh, we spoke to him the day before. Uh, his dad had made chicken and dressing, and uh, he was going to come by and get a bowl of dressing. He said, make sure we saved it for him. And and, and how did he sound to you? Fine. He, he sounded fine. And, and what were his plans? Because he had some plans to do some things, didn't he? Uh, yes, he was uh, fixing to pick up his boys and uh, and one of his stepchildren from, a, from his previous marriage. The coming weekend, and he was also... Looking forward to his oldest one moving in with him, who had just turned 12. So he had all kinds of plans and things with his family. He, he didn't have any depressional issues. He didn't. Did he tell you anything about his current girlfriend at the time, that how the relationship was going, or did you know anything about that? No, I had met her just briefly two or three times. What did you think of her, Mom, when you met her? Well, I really didn't have a lot of opinion of her because I was only around her maybe 15 or 20 minutes, and she'd take off to the bar. So, you know, we didn't talk very much. And, and so she really wasn't... In, he, how long was he dating her before the murder? Uh, June the 21st was when uh, he started going with her. Sick? She moved in July 4th weekend. She moved in... Wow. Uh-huh. That's very quick. That's very quick. Mm -hmm. um, and and did she have children of her own? <laughs> she had uh, three girls and, and none of them were living with her. None of them were living with her. Did you did you know why? Did you ask? Uh, I I don't really know the details. I just know it wasn't a good situation with her. And, and did you did you say anything to Daniel about that? Maybe you found that strange, or that because she didn't have children, her own children. Did you find that that was very odd? No, not really. Because at first uh, she had one of the girls come uh, out here with them that day. So I thought, you know, I thought actually thought that, that she was going to live with Daniel and her. And then come to find out she was living with uh, the girl's mother. D did Daniel display any, you know, did he ever say he was disappointed or, or not upset with her in some way or that they were having well, problems? No, uh, what I remember most is uh, he was mad one day because she had spent $200 on a vet bill for a dog and he didn't, he didn't appreciate that at all. Was, was she, was she, did she have access to his money? Was she what? Did she have access to his funds? Yeah. Um, 
he had a lot of cash there, and he had claimed it. Uh, there was a lot missing, but he also had a checkbook that I found after he died that she had signed close to a thousand dollars worth of checks. That she had signed his name. You know what? Let's hold up. We're going to take a break. We're going to be right back now with uh, the Underwood case. Daniel Underwood lost his life. September 4th, 2008. We're going to be back with Maria Harvick and Donna Underwood. And hopefully, if we can get Denny Griffin to come on with us at the half hour, we will. Stay with us, everybody. Welcome back to Time's Up with the Jane Wayne of Justice, Susan Murphy Milano. Joining Delilah and I for the continuation of the Donner Underwood, not Donner Underwood, Daniel Underwood case. He was found dead on September 4th, 2008 in Sulphur uh, Springs, Texas. Under very suspicious circumstances, he was um, he found dead of a gunshot wound or still alive and then brought to the hospital where he was pronounced dead. We have us, with us, besides Donna Underwood, we have Maria Harvick. And, and Maria, you knew Daniel, didn't you? Yes. And he was a real good friend of mine. He was a real good friend of yours. And he had invited you to move in the house? Yes. Okay. He was trying to help me through my divorce. And um, and then did you meet his then-girlfriend, Rebecca? I'd met her prior to that. And and when you met her I'd prior to that, did, did she... Uh, um, did, you, did you know her long before... Because you, know, you agreed to move in the house. Yeah, I was moving in the house with him. Um, he'd offered me a room for rent, and I took him up on his offer because he only lived a block around for my kids, so that way I could still go get him up for school in the morning. But I had, didn't really know her before that, just talked to her like acquaintance just every now and then when Did I saw her. Did you know about her, anything about her from the area, the neighborhood? Um, yeah, I knew her from when I'd go to sing karaoke at the bar, and she liked to go play pool with the guys. Okay. And I knew her then. But um, I didn't really know how she was, uh, just from what people had told me, that she always liked to hang around the guys, and she, every guy she met, she would get engaged with and move in with until the money ran out, is what I'd heard about her. Okay. And so she had this pattern of conduct where she kind of did that for what Was she heard. from that area? Yeah. Was she, had she um, always I, lived in that area? I think she, she'd she been living in the area, but I really don't know if she was born there. I think her mother lived around the area, and she's the one that had her girls. Okay. okay. I'm going to preface this by saying I, I actually I have your affidavit. I've got a signed affidavit and notarized and witnessed. And sometimes what happens in these cases is that people are traumatized by the crime scene. Um, Maria, how tall are you? 411. Okay, and how tall is Rebecca? Ooh, she's probably, I'm going to say probably about 5'8". Okay. It isn't an excuse, but, but for the audience, what I want you to see is that, again, when you're traumatized and somebody has just fired a gun and murdered somebody, it's not that you're not, not telling the truth. It's that you don't remember and you are also afraid. So something else kicks in sometimes. And in my opinion, in this case, that is what happened. So that night, I, I'm actually going to read your statement because it... It, and it's not the statement that you give police, but it's the statement that's going to hold up now because we are going to take this to some people in Texas, hopefully the Texas Attorney General, to get this case opened and the death certificate changed for a couple of reasons. One, it is a murder in my opinion. And two, Donna Underwood, you have two grandchildren or three who don't or aren't allowed to have benefits because Daniel's case was, was stamped a suicide on the death certificate. Is that correct? Um, well, he had some insurance that they... No, but I mean from the benefits for them, entitlements and different things, because he was basically the breadwinner, but the suicide really hurts the, the ability to apply for Social Security benefits. Well, I don't know. Their mother took care of all that, so I'm not really sure about that. Okay. I checked into it, and they're not able to do that at the oh. moment. All right. So, um, Maria... Yes. On, on, a, on, a, on the affidavit, and, and, and you say, Maria Harvick, known to me, a credible person, lawful age, duly sworn, this and deposes and says to me um, that you, 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 you go through all of this, and also that you had met with Danny and Dono, um, his parents, and um, yeah. that uh, you basically say that 
Rebecca was fighting and struggling with Daniel over the gun. Yes. And so where are you in the relationship to the house when 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 the the gun is in both their hands basically? I'm in the end of the hallway. You're in the end of the hallway. Bed. You, you saw Rebecca grab the gun several times and she kept shaking it back and forth. Not yes. like she was trying to pull away from Daniel, but rather pushing and shoving it towards him. She did have a hold of the gun at the time it actually went off. Now, yes. Lila. What kind of gun? Shotgun. It, it was a shotgun? Okay. Yes, a sawed-off shotgun. And, and so he, that she, Rebecca, the girlfriend at the time, who has never been charged with the murder of Daniel, she has the gun in her possession. Yes. And they both have their hands on it. And they both have their hands on it. Now, prior to the gun incident, was there conversation from Rebecca at all about the relationship or, or you know, what was going on with them if they were breaking up? Yes, she had she had pulled me and another friend of mine into the restroom at a bar and told us that she wanted to break up with him because he had lost his job and she was ready to move on and she still loved her ex-boyfriend Daniel, another Daniel. And that's not what you got from Daniel Underwood, is it? No. What did he tell you prior to him dying? He, as far as I knew, he had plans. He had already invited me and a friend of mine had plans to take her out for her birthday and wanted us to come along. Okay, but how was the relationship with the two of them? Um, it was fine, except for he said he didn't like it. She was always um, he taking his cards and taking money to play poker whenever he didn't even want to go to the club. So he'd call me to go with him so he'd have somebody to talk to while she played poker. And then she'd tell him she wasn't going to charge any more to his card, but then she would go charge more drinks and more poker chips. Wait, so were they breaking up because he was ending it or she was? She wanted to break it off, but you, he didn't know nothing about it. Okay. And and did she mention anything about a beneficiary, being a beneficiary on anything? Yeah, she had told me and a bunch of other people. We were all standing around, and she kept telling everybody she was a beneficiary of all of his stuff. Donna I don't Underwood, know why she brought da, that up. Okay. Donna Underwood, did police interview any of those other people that you know of? Uh, no. They, they asked her about it, and she said she didn't know if he had any life insurance. But she started telling me that she owned all Daniel's vehicles and his home and everything. And that wasn't true, was it? <laughs> Do what? That was not true, was it? No, no, it wasn't. Okay. Was there ever any life insurance policy found anywhere? Uh, he did have a life insurance that his ex-wife had uh, got for his children. Okay. So she made this all up? As far as I know, she did. I, I, she just blowed me away. She, she cussed me out telling me about it. And And, and so... Maria, you're at the house, the gun goes off, and Daniel is on the floor. What does, yes. tell me what Rebecca does with the gun. She shoves it into the back room, because they're standing at the end of the hallway, and on the back side there's their bedroom, and on the other side was his boy's bedroom. And she shoved the gun into the boy's bedroom and then turned Daniel over because he landed on oh, his Oh, stop, 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 stop. She turned his body over after she shot him? Yes. And that's how his legs ended up on the gun. Okay, so he, his body is physically turned over by Rebecca, the girlfriend, at the time yes. after she shoots him. How, and is she crying? Is she upset? Is she saying to you she anything? Was already, she was already crying, but it was... It was her fake cry. She was good at acting. And, and so, does she ask you to help him turn him over? No, no. At this time, I'm looking for a phone to go call. I tell her we need to call 911, but she doesn't want me to, so I called a friend of mine, which I forgot. I already had him on the line, so he was on the line when this all this happened. So I he could hear the, the conversation, or could he hear the shot? Yes. yes, he heard it. He heard the shot. Did he hear the conversation? Um, I don't remember if he said he did or not, um, but he had also gave a statement to the police, and he was also interviewed. Okay. Why? What was the reason she did not want you to call 911? I don't know. She was just kind of freaking out, and I was freaked out, too. Um, I'd I'm never sure. before seen anybody be shot. Right. And, and, and so where did when the gun went off, did it, it went to Daniel's head, correct? Yes. 
It's and so there was matter. There was probably different things about on the floor. There was what? Different parts of him, perhaps, on the floor because it was a sawed-off shotgun. Yes. yes. And he was still breathing after this. Yes, he still was. And and you yes. could see. Could, did you know that, or did Rebecca know that? I don't know. If she knew. I was just concentrated on him. Um, I was trying to check on him, and I I had sat down beside him, and she sat down and squashed in between me and him and was just sitting there, and I told her, you need to go call 911. How badly is he bleeding at this point, Maria? He, he was bleeding bad in his his scalp and, and his eye and everything, and it was gone. Um, but he, cause he was still looking straight at me with the other eye, and he was still breathing because I could still see him breathing, fighting to breathe. Were you worried that and at any I, time that this woman was going to take the gun on you at some point? Did that cross I, I your was, mind at all? Yeah, probably was. Now I think about it, I think I was. Um, but at that time, I just was concentrating on him and trying to call 911. And did she she tell you that there was certain information that she wanted you to tell the police when they came? Uh, no, she at that time, no. She was just uh, hysterical. His, hysterical? Her, hysterical how? His, hysterical? I mean, she fired that shot. So, and it, was she covered in blood when she turned him over? No, she started smearing herself on like she was trying to act like she was hugging and trying to hug on him and, and still saying, my fiance, my okay, fiance. Okay, wait, 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 whoa, 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 whoa. You're telling me that she takes the blood of a man that she just shoots so that she could show that they had some sort of a yes. struggle? Well, I don't know if it was just a struggle or just to say that it was all over her because it wasn't all over her, um before she got down there. And so she takes his blood from where he, where he's bleeding and puts it on her? Yes. Yeah. She's rubbing her arms all over it, and then she's wiping it on her shirt and her pants. And did you think that that was something was wrong with that? Did you question it? Did you... Uh, no, then I didn't question any of that till afterwards, after, I guess, the shock was over with, which was probably a week or so later. How loud longer. was that gunshot to your ear? Pretty deafening, wasn't it? Yes, yes. And, and so, so she, she's rubbing blood on her to, to, to make it look like, and that's the only reason that would be, but you can't explain, or anybody can explain, why the, the body was turned over. Does the police ever know this? Well, I remember telling them that, but I don't know if they ever wrote it down. No, but it didn't, it didn't reflect it. I'm looking at the police report. It doesn't reflect it in those things. As far as the specifics, do you tell them that she wipes blood of Daniel all over her? Mm, no, I just told them that she was touching him, and that's how she got blood on her, but I didn't say she was rubbing it at the time. Okay. You're still in shock from this, from what happens. You know what? Let's take a quick break. Stay with us. This is the Daniel Underwood case uh, murdered on September 4th, 2008. We are with Donna Underwood, his mom, and Maria Harvick, who was there that night, a witness to this. And we have her documented, um, notarized words right in front of us. Stay with us, everybody. Blazing the trail, the Jane Wayne of justice is circling the courthouses of America, speaking up for those who have been silenced. Susan Murphy Milano declares, time's up. And now, back to Susan Murphy Milano, because there's never too much Susan Murphy Milano. Thank you for joining us, everybody. We are talking about the Daniel Ray Underwood case. He was murdered on September 4th, 2008 in Sulphur Springs, Texas. We are also joined now by my counterpart on CrimeWire on Tuesday evenings, Danny Griffin, who is a retired uh, investigator. He is also an author of many, many books. If you go to DennisNGriffin.com, you can see his amazing, amazing writings and, and, and check up on, on him. He's been on the show before. And... Denny, welcome to the show, sir. Thank you very much, Susan. Pleasure to be with you again. Um, we are talking to Maria before the break about the things that happened, the blood that, that Rebecca wipes on the shirt, and, and the different things that happened, and that basically um, you tell Rebecca to call 911 and that and 
to help Daniel, and she keeps saying, no, no, wait, no, no, hold on, no, no, wait. Daniel was, I'm going to read some more of the statement. Daniel was confronting Rebecca about some missing money, and he seemed to be trying to scare her into telling him about it. Daniel was also saying he wanted to teach her a lesson. Daniel was telling Rebecca that he had just gotten her money from the ATM, so I thought by him making that kind of statement that, that she must have had been some demanding some more. Daniel kept saying she was taking all of his money. Daniel was holding the gun. Um, don't touch, don't touch. Uh, Daniel, I'll F and do it. Daniel said, uh, but police, Rebecca did not want you, and she had the wherewithal to say to you that she didn't want police to know they were fighting, did she? No, she she did tell me that once we finally got up to the police station. She, she told me she, not to tell them that they had argued earlier that night. Okay, and um, you, Daniel's but I take, did tell them. Daniel is taken to the hospital. Police come, and you are all told to put up your hands. Yes. Okay. And get and walk out of the house. And walk out of the house because they don't know what's going on. Right. Do they and speak? I understood that, so I tried to get out, but she didn't want to get up and get out. Do they? She didn't want to get up and get out. Do they speak to her first? Who do they speak to out of all of you? Me. Me, because she's still on the phone calling everybody. She's calling everybody. Is she using her phone or Daniel's? Daniel's. When I finally got her to call 911, she, she ran. When she saw I was going for it, she ran for it and said, oh, no, I'll do it, and she grabbed his phone, not hers. So who calls 911, actually? She does or you? She did. She did. Okay. How many phone calls were made before 911 was called? That's right. How many? Uh, no, no, I don't know. I don't know who she called before She's calling that, other people before I, she makes 911 call. He's bleeding there to death, and that's what she does? She's making other calls to other people? No, she don't make the calls to other people until after. Okay. Dan, uh, uh, Denny, okay, Griffin, yeah. please help me here. You, you know, you're supposed to be the, some love that you're in, involved with, you're living with. He's, he's paying for you financially. And you're talking to somebody after he's kind of bleeding to death on the floor there? Yeah, that certainly is, is alarming. And, you know, it, it doesn't make any sense at all. You would think that the first thing she would want to do is get him help. I mean, uh, to hell with everybody else. Uh, you'd want to get medical personnel on the way. And... Uh, you know, and, and see if he could be saved. To to, to not do that, to have to be uh, basically forced into calling for assistance is certainly bizarre, to say the least. And uh, uh, it's not behavior, in my opinion, consistent with someone who's, uh, who's a boyfriend uh, who she supposedly cares for very much his, his life is in danger, and, uh, and she's not that interested in getting help for him. I don't, uh, I can't quite buy into that. And so that's what concerns me is that you, you know, you have this traumatic situation going on, and you have someone there who's thinking about what her story is going to be, basically, and and she's telling you, Maria, what you're supposed to say. You know, all of this is going on in her head rather than trying to save him. Right, right. I was the one trying to talk to the police, asking them what was going on. Was he still doing all right? She was still on the phone calling the bartender and all her bar friends and everybody telling them he just shot himself, but I'm the beneficiary is exactly what she kept telling everybody. Uh, and, and, and Who discusses that kind of stuff when this is going on? That that makes no killer. sense to me. So, so... The she, ambulance hadn't even arrived yet, and she's still on the phone calling everybody. And, and, is she, wow. she, and she's not even near Daniel and comforting him. You are, aren't you? Yes. Are you covered in as much I, blood as she puts on herself? No, just my hands where I, when he, I saw him struggling to breathe, and he was choking on his blood, so I turned his head because I told her to do it, but she didn't. So I reached across there and turned his head um, so that he wouldn't choke on his blood. And tell me... About the re- she because she wanted him obviously to die. Tell me about the responding officers who come to the scene. Do do they talk to you nicely? Do they question you? Do they do they seem to question Marie, uh, Rebecca the same way as they do you, Maria? No, no. Uh, what's they the difference? Didn't. <laughs> well, she's she's being by then she's finally got through making all her phone calls. She's being herself, her happy, flirty self with all the cops. Uh, no it, way. It, it, they're, yeah. Yeah, they're, okay. Um, and and here, you know, Denny. Here is here is the mother, Donna, who has. I don't see this very often in the case workup that we have. 
she has gone and gotten incident reports. She has gone and and left no stone unturned, Denny, and, and, and to get justice, to get people to listen. Now we have a notarized affidavit of facts. Why are these families, why do they seem to have to jump through hoops constantly for the truth to get these cases changed from the initial suicide to either an uns- a suspicious or a homicide? I, c- I can only speculate, Susan. I, I don't know these particular officers or this police agency that was involved, but cops and agencies that I am familiar with, I know that um, if you have to go back basically and change something, you're pretty much admitting that perhaps you made a mistake. You or your officers made a mistake initially. Perhaps the investigation wasn't really up to speed. Maybe things weren't done that should have been done. And when it's it's admitting a mistake, in my opinion, that's the way some people look at it. And uh, if if they don't have to do that, some people, some agencies would just as soon pass and say, "Hey, look." We did a good job here. Uh, everything was done according to Hoyle, so therefore there's no need to reopen this thing. And, uh, you know, out of sight, out of mind. Uh, and I think that's, in many cases, I can't speak for all, but uh, I think in many cases the officers or the agency involved or the medical examiner, whoever, does not want to admit that they may have erred in their initial uh, conduct. It's, it's called balls. They lose okay. it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's just, I'm just, I'm, I am really so disappointed because it really does go towards justice. This man, in my opinion, was a, a victim of intimate partner homicide by his girlfriend. And did I understand, Maria, correctly that uh, when Rebecca was on the phone uh, calling apparently several different people, she was telling each one that, um, that this was a, a suicide, right, that he had shot yeah. himself? Yeah, she was just saying, Daniel just shot himself, and I'm the beneficiary. He just made me beneficiary. <laughs> you know, it, it sounds like the first thing that went through her mind when once that shot gun went off or that shot was fired was, oops, now what can I do to get myself out of this? Uh, not yes. what can I do for Daniel, but oops. And she I, wanted him to die. Some questions asked here. I better come up with something quick. So right. certainly all these people I, she calls, if I the had, police interview them, they right. can say, well, how was she, oh, she said he Tom. shot himself. You know, I mean, it sounds to me like she was covering her bases uh, very rapidly there. Yes, because I had told the cop already that, that I wasn't um, supposed to move in until later. She talked me into it all day, the day before and that day, to come stay. We need a little pattern of conduct music here now, uh, Dustin, on this show, because this is a pattern of conduct, and it is something that we see time and time again. So she set up so that you were there. Well, yes, you know, you know, yes, I see that now. It surprises me, too, that she's going on about the ben- him committing suicide. She's the beneficiary. Does she not realize that by... If indeed he did pay or commit suicide, they weren't going to pay off. Some some policies do. Some policies have the clause after two years that they they pay off. So so she she is insisting that you were there so that you are the alibi. Donna Underwood, uh, Daniel's mom. When do you learn? When do you get the phone call that something has happened? Um, it was probably about one twenty four or something like that. Uh, In the morning. Yes. Yes. And who calls and she you? She called me mom when she started talking to me and it just confused me because you know my daughter i had just talked to my daughter in fact i was just fixing to lay down who calls your mom rebecca yes yes and that took me back you know i had to get it in my mind who is this on the phone you know because my daughter has she ever called you that before no maybe she thought that that there were benefits there to her um money-wise and things and she thought that she was somehow you know imaginarily related to you yes and she told me, uh, later on at the hospital, she told me that she grabbed for the gun and uh, got got a hold of his hand and was holding it. And the, the cops asked her about that later, and she said, no, I never grabbed for that gun, and I never held his hand. And she told it in front of me and my daughter, my husband, uh, three or four good friends, and just a bunch of people at the hospital. So she her story hasn't hospital. been consistent from day one. Again, you know, Denny, she... She, Rebecca, takes the body and turns it over after she shoots him. And then the gun is under his legs. 
Mm-hmm. Yeah, that you, um, Donna, is the, the department, the police agency that investigated this, what what's their reputation? Are, 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 first, is it a big department? Are they got a reputation for being real sharp, or uh, what, what are they like? I, it's a small place. Uh, Sulphur Springs is about 4, uh, 14,000. Well, we tried to do something a couple of months ago with the Texas Rangers who told me that they didn't want to get, because they didn't want to get in trouble because there's a jurisdictional in old Texas, and it would be like, pissing on somebody else's territory but basically that's what they said to me so we're going to go we're going another route with this case uh we have to take a commercial break we are with denny griffin my partner from crime wire we are with donna underwood maria havoc delilah jones from Major publicity and we are discussing the daniel underwood case and this is not over by a long shot so stay with us everybody we'll be right back Susan Murphy Milano. Time's up. As Susan proves there's more to her reputation than a keen mind and a sweet stack of subpoenas. And now, much more Susan Murphy Milano. don't have a lot of time. We only have 12 minutes, and, th- and this whole hour has not been enough to cover this case. Um, we are going to continue this on the circuit of other shows, blogs, until we get justice for Daniel Underwood, who was, in my opinion, murdered on September 4th in Sulphur Springs, Texas, in 2008. And, Maria, at break we were talking about that night after the murder, after Daniel was shot. What does Rebecca do in the home? In the hall? In the home. <laughs> In the home, she's still, was she still milk next to him? No, 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 in the home, when she's at the, she goes back to the house, what does she do? She goes back and grabs his laptop and uh, his pool stick and a lot of his um, property that she could sell. She goes back with two other people at that the, night. At the police station that night, who, do, does she go by herself? Do you and she go? Does she console you? Does she talk to you? Who is she at the police station with? I couldn't even drive myself, so a friend of mine drove me, but she told police she could drive. She went off somewhere and picked up the bartender's boyfriend, her brother, and her ex-boyfriend, Daniel. Are those people, were those people, did they go and ransack the house after the shooting? Um, I, I know her, she did, and her ex-boyfriend, and two other people. Denny, help me here. As a former law enforcement officer... And, you know, we we do so many of these cases, you know, on Tuesday nights in Crime Wire and, and other places. This is this is such a, a travesty. Well, you know, I'm I'm surprised uh, that it was so quick. The decision was so quick that this was a suicide. I mean, I I think um, obviously they. There was other information out there. There were things that needed to be done. And to not consider this and treat it as a crime scene, limiting the access to the to the area and to the property. Unless, and, and unless so would, forth, would it, it make it, sense? It's just bizarre they wouldn't take some precautions until they had completed a thorough investigation. They didn't do that. Denny, if she was a, a, an informant, if Rebecca was some kind of an informant who might have said something and then that would have disarmed them from doing their jobs, is that possible? Well, uh, yeah, it, uh, it's possible. I would hate to think that they would go so far with it as to cover a murder. That that would, uh, you know, it's one thing maybe to get somebody out of a DWI or something like that. But uh, but but it is possible. I mean, you know, that when when they when they have the cards and they're calling the shots, they can do pretty much what they want. So, not being familiar with the people or, uh, you know, I, I guess I. I'm not in a position to rule anything out. Uh, and, and let me throw this out at you, because although it doesn't have anything to do with it, but it does, we've recently learned that Rebecca's, uh, I don't know if it's recent, fairly recent boyfriend, has also died in another state in a, of, of, of suspicious circumstances. Boy, it would be nice to know if she was a beneficiary or something <laughs> in that deal, too. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it, you know, it's certainly out of out of... It depends if you believe in coincidence or not. I'm not a big coincidence guy. And when uh, when things like that happen, I always think they should be looked at a little more, uh, a little closer before you 
before you disregard them. So uh, if she had yet another boyfriend or ex-boyfriend or whatever, that uh, any suspicious uh, death situation... Hey, all of a sudden he's dead. Uh, yeah, I'd, I'd be interested in pursuing that a little bit. I think they need to check into it because when she had took Daniel's laptop and his cell phone, now I realize why she got his cell phone to call 911 was because she went through and erased a bunch of stuff on his phone and on the laptop. So that computer, then, well, nobody knows for sure what might have been on there, right? I mean, she she took it. Right, yes. And, and so she had access back into the house. In today, uh, God. Yes, and then somehow part of his scalp ended up way across the other side, down the hallway, across the living room, by his Zippo collection. A part of his scalp? Yes, and and we were nowhere near that area. Okay. Yeah, they didn't even document it with a photo of it. So there, what kind of crime scene photos are there, Donna? <sighs> Not very much, because there, there had been a struggle in the living room, and also she had boxes of her possessions uh, boxed up in the living room. Who did, Rebecca? Yes, and Nana Daniels was in those boxes, and they were in the living room. They didn't take any pictures of those and no pictures of the struggle. However, the ranger had his uh, briefcase set. She was throwing she was throwing DVDs at him in the living room before all of the other happened. So they were so she was doing a lot of that, but again, she had you as the witness there. So, so yeah. to corroborate what she is saying, and yeah, but I told police I I was not her friend. He was my friend. I knew him, not her. Okay, but again, and, and, and Denny. What we had said at the beginning of the show was that sometimes people are so traumatized. I also think that it had something to do with how big Rebecca is and how little Maria isn't or is. That the size, the height, a foot taller, basically, or, you know, and weight, that once somebody shoots somebody like that, that they are then traumatized further in, in, psych, in, in a quiet kind of way, thinking, oh my gosh, I better kind of do what I'm told, otherwise I could be shot too. Um, oh, certainly, certainly can be intimidated. God, you see somebody, uh, you know, dead on the floor or dying there at, at the hands or with this person being complicit, at least, in it. Uh, it, it certainly can make you, you know, you, you think, uh, I better watch what I say because I could be next. And, and Maria... Right, you, I disagreed with her when she told me not to say anything. Uh, but but, but Maria, argument. you didn't say a lot of things, and I know you were scared, and I had said this to you at the beginning that by coming forward now, um, it, it's going to change a lot of things. It's going to change a lot of things for this case because it's new information, new developments um, of things that we didn't know before, her moving the body, her covering herself, um, the things that she had done, her pattern of conduct before, after, and during, and, and for Daniel, and because you've been talking to, to Donna, which helps a lot. Um, yes. And, and I think that people listening who have information, Delilah, on these crimes, not just this one, but every one that we put out, the fear factor that goes into them, the dating relationships, the knowing that information comes back so many years later, it's somebody's life. And all anybody wants is justice. And, and here's this woman out there who, is, who has, in my opinion, probably struck once, twice, and is going to do it again. And, you know, it's about a murder she committed. She planned. She had Maria there as her alibi. And, 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 Denny, speak to the importance of, of somebody who knows anything ever, that this is how cases get solved and, and, and you know, justice gets, gets implemented. Exactly. you got to hope, you know, almost every case, somebody knows something. If it's, if it's not the, uh, the, the killer, him or herself, certainly it's somebody else. They tell somebody, somebody was a witness, somebody knows some circumstances that would point to the uh, to the killer and it's a matter of getting people and people are scared no question about it people don't want to get involved people don't want to end up on a witness stand somewhere people are afraid if they say something they could end up not only maybe in physical danger but getting sued or something so there, there's all kinds of reasons i guess for people to not want to come forward Got and it. they're worried about coming forward but in the long run you've and I'm not saying it just about this case, I'm talking generally speaking. You have to, if you know something that will help solve a crime, you've got to do what's right. That's That's got to be the bottom line. You might not like it, you might not want to do it, but at some point, because to exist as a society with our system here, that's the way it has to be done. If If people won't 
where people will close their eyes to criminal activity and not be willing to help the authorities bring these people to justice, we're in a hell of a mess. So as tough as it is, and I compliment you, Maria, for coming forward now and, and helping to get this yes, case back on track. Much. And I wish I wish there were more people like you. Yeah, you're very brave for doing this, and and um, I, I and we we have Maria in a different location for the next month or two. So if Rebecca wants to get a hold of her, uh, my my Gmail account is times up for justice at gmail dot com. Um, I suggest that that you think about this. We know that she's going to listen to the show, Donna Underwood. Your grandchildren are going to listen to this at some point in the future. And the one that you just... Did, did your daughter have the baby yet? No. Okay. She's about to have it. And and yeah. I know that your husband has passed. What would you like to say to your grandchildren who will at some point listen to this about their father and, and, and the importance of what you're trying to do? I can't, I can't talk. I don't you can't talk. Okay. Um, I, I did want to tell you that the youngest one, he was uh, six at the time, and he missed his daddy so much. And he, he said that if he wanted the time watch so he could turn that clock back, his daddy would still be here. Um, you're a very brave woman. I mean, you have not stopped. Uh, you have pursued justice every way that you can from the, the amount I brought with me just like a fraction of the boxes of documents that I have, the CDs that I have, the information that I have, um, and we are going to do everything that we can. Uh, we're going to put you on the Ross Show next week, so I suggest that, Rebecca, uh, you come join us. And again, I, I hope that you email me at timesupforjustice at gmail.com or go ahead and email me at murphymilano at gmail.com. Girlie, you better lawyer up, because in the state of Texas... We are going to work and do everything we can to bring justice to Daniel Underwood. If anybody that is listening, um, in light of just all these cases, uh, if you are in a violent situation, if you are in a relationship that you are uncertain, if you get a divorce and are leaving the relationship and you don't know what to do, please, please, please go and get the book Time's Up. Um, you can find it at Amazon.com. Go and look at the video on SusanMurphyMilano.com. And, and preserve your words. In my opinion, had Daniel preserved his words prior to him kicking her out or ending the relationship or, um, you know, we wouldn't be talking about this perhaps. And that in all of these cases, Debbie Hemby, or Holly Demby, I'm sorry, out of, out of um, Ohio, Lorraine County, who is now, you know, fighting from the grave basically. She didn't, didn't have the chance to preserve her words. For every defense attorney out there who thinks that they can win or get their client off for a mental issue or, um, or defend them in a way that we allow this country to defend people who kill those who profess to love them, go and get the Time's Up book. And I'm sure, Delilah, you would agree because all these missing persons cases that we see, um, you know, day in and day out across the country, there's no place for people to go. No, and these victims need a voice. That's right. And and you can help us be a voice again. And if you have a case you'd like us to put on, please email us at timesupforjustice at gmail.com. We'll be happy to look at it. Uh, join us every Tuesday for Crime Wire, every Wednesday for the Raw Show. Thank you so much, Donna Underwood. Um, and I hope that the grandbaby is, is a healthy one. Uh, thank you, Maria Harvick. Thank you, Denny Griffin. And Denny Griffin's website is www.dennisngriffin.com. Delilah at imaginepublicity.com. Everybody here at the Zeus Radio Network who works so hard to make us look so good every week. Um, and if you'd like to be an advertiser here, please get a hold of us again at Time's Up for at uh, Time's Up for Justice at gmail.com. Until next week, everybody, God bless. And